Good morning, good morning. We are starting our new series today, Why Church? It's really a fascinating uh, conversational piece of topic because uh, for a while we've been asking this question, why do we do church? Why does the church matter? Why is it important? In fact, you may have woke up this morning and as you were getting ready, you may have turned to your kids or your spouse who was sitting at the breakfast table watching uh, either cartoons or TV or something or the news, and you said, hey, it's time to go. And your kids or even your spouse looked at you and said, but mom or dear, why do we have to go to church? Right? And you're sitting there wrestling, pulling them away from the brain melting machine. And your answer, of course, is because I said so, right? <clears throat> On your drive in, then you may have realized that you missed the teachable moment, all right? In fact, as you're thinking about that and trying to overcome your own guilt of missing yet another opportunity to pour into your child's mind, you think to yourself, why, why, why do we go to church? Huh. And you start to kind of formulate an answer you might give to your spouse or your children, and you, you struggle a little bit with that. Now, if you're a guest with us this morning, you may be here this morning going, wait a second, this is a great question I want to know, because I'm here, but I want to know why should I, why should I come back? Why should I come back? Or, or maybe you're sitting there saying to yourself, you know what, the reason I come to church is because it's Sunday morning, and this is what you do on Sunday morning, because it's quite possible that you just formed a godly habit, that you've been repeating since you were a child, and you just know hey, it's Sunday morning, we get up and we go to church because that's what good people do. This morning we want to ask the question, and ask it at an in-depth level, and we're going to continue to ask about what the church is, who the church is, and why we participate in church, because no one really goes to church. You can come to this building, but we remember that this is just a building. That church is wherever two or more are gathered in Jesus' name. Let me say it again. Church is wherever two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, which also means you can't do church by yourself. Now, that in mind, I've been asking this question for a while. Why do we go to church? In fact, you may not have asked this question for a while. And, and, and what I want to do is I want to challenge you. Just stop and think about it for a second. All right? Why, why participate in church? So I've been asking for a while, and here's a couple of answers I got. Let me give you a few. Because it's Sunday and we go to church. Because my mom makes me. Because grandma buys lunch after church. That's my favorite one of all of them that I got. And I was like, man, I want to be part of that family for a while, okay? <laughs> or one that hit it real close to home and may be actually more truth than we want to admit. Because if I don't, I'll feel guilty on Monday. What's interesting, again, is that many of us have not asked the question as to why we go to church or why we should or shouldn't go to church. And so one of the challenges with that for church people, those who come on a regular basis, one of the challenges with that is then we, we do a terrible job of marketing Jesus to other people. You see, I can't invite someone to church because it's what we do on Sunday morning. Nobody gets really excited about that because your neighbor says to you, well, I do other stuff on Sunday morning. And to say to them, well, I go to church on Sunday morning so I don't go and feel guilty on Monday, your neighbor should reply to you, well, that doesn't sound like a very good motivator. Why would you want to go anywhere that makes you feel guilty? See, the church hasn't done a good job of understanding why we do what we do. And so we begin this whole sermon series asking, why church? Why church? Let's go back to the basics to answer this. Let's go back to the basics. The whole purpose that the church exists is to move clo people closer to Jesus. Let me say that again. The whole purpose that the church exists for is to move people closer to Jesus. Therefore, the church as the body of Christ should be one of the most effective methods or tools of introducing people to Jesus. Now, when I think of church, let me be clear. Again, it's wherever two or more are gathered in Jesus' name. It's not just what we do on Sunday morning. It's the small groups we have. It's the, the Bible studies we have. It's the outings that we do as a church family. So I think big church here, okay? And, and again, if we, if we gather together in Jesus' name, there's church, and we should be the most effective tool in moving people closer to God. We should be the most effective tool in moving people closer to God. 
So why do we do what we do? Well, the answer is found in Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2. If you have your e-vice, we're just going to stare at this one verse this morning. Romans 12, 2. It says this. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me say it again. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's interesting, this word conformed is more of a sculpting word. It talks about someone taking what's there, like the putty or the clay, and trying to sculpt it to the way they want it to be. So the world is sculpting you. The world is trans, uh, excuse me, the world is conforming you all right, to a pattern, to a behavior, to a set of habits that you have that involve the ways of this world. So Paul's saying, look, don't let someone come, don't let the world sculpture you into the patterns and the behaviors of the world, but rather, instead of being conformed, be transformed. So where the world takes what you are and says, that's good enough, in fact, we like it, we're just going to mold a little bit. Jesus says, no, what you are is not what I want you to be. I'm going to not only not conform you, but I'm going to transform you because I want you to be more than meets the eye. Yeah, slid that one right in there, didn't I? All right. and, and I'm going to transform you by what? By what? By what? How am I going to transform you? By the renewing, by the renewing of the mind. So basically what we're saying is this. If this is the answer to why we go to church, basically what we're saying is this. We come to church to help us keep our focus on Jesus. But how I'd like to say it today is what gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. Another way to say that is you don't think about what you're not thinking about. I know, you're sitting there thinking, man, we have a really brilliant pastor up there just giving us these really pithy, amazing statements. I bet he spent all week thinking about them. And not just that, but I spent all month thinking about them, all right? All right, what we, what's true. We don't think about what we don't think about. Have you ever thought about that? It's, it's absolutely true. If you're not thinking about it, you don't think about it. It's absolutely true. Right? And the same thing happens to church. You see, when we don't come to church, what we're not thinking about, we don't think about because what gets reminded gets remembered. And when we don't come to church, we begin to lose our focus on Jesus. Because when we don't think about Jesus, we don't think about Jesus. And so one of the reasons why we come to church is to be reminded about what we want to be remembered, about what we want to remember. Because what gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. Again, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. The patterns of this world want you to forget about Jesus. They want to conform you to the behaviors of this world, and they don't have anything to do with Jesus. Where Jesus says, look, I don't want you to conform. I want you to be transformed, all right, by the renewing of your mind. I want thoughts to be in your head that transform you into something that you never were or that the world can't even understand. I want you to act like Jesus. I want you to think like Jesus. I want you to align your words, your actions, your behavior around Jesus. So what's this renewing of the mind thing really look like then? Did you know that stuff seeps into your head that you don't want in there? Did you know that? Yeah? Yeah? Stuff seeps into your head that you don't want to, or stuff that you don't really think you're thinking about, but you think about it because it's being heard or said or read or behaved in such a way that you're seeing it all the time, and so it seeps into your head, and you didn't even know it was there, but it's there. Did you know that? An example. I'm going to give you an example. Let's see how many of you can play this game with me. I'm going to just kind of hum a little jingle. You see if you can get to the end of it, and here's what I know is that no one in this room sat out in the past year and said, I want to learn how this goes, all right? Not a one of you did that. You, none of you sat down and you replayed it and replayed it and replayed it just so you could learn how it goes. But here's what I'm going to bet. I'm going to bet that 75 or maybe more of us, 75% or maybe more of us, know how this jingle goes, okay? So I'm going to do the first half, and if you know it really loud, now don't be shy, okay? Don't, turn to your neighbor and just look him in the eye and say, look, don't be shy now, okay? This is church. We've got we to bail it out, Okay? Ready? You ready? I'm going to do the first half. You do the second half. Ready? It goes like this. It goes, ba da ba 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 Look at that. Now, how many of you sat down this year and said, I need to learn that McDonald's jingle? Anybody? Any hands? Any hands? No hands. But you know what? It seeped in your head. Why? Because it was repeated and you heard it over and over again. What was funny is I did it in the first service and like two people knew it. 
And I told him, I said, that's second service. They're going to know this one, all right? But, but here's what. You didn't, seek out to, you didn't set out to learn that, but it's, it snuck into your brain. Because why? Because you heard it over and over and over and over and over again. You saw it on commercials. And, and again, it just kind of sat in the back of your head. Even though you weren't thinking about it or intentionally trying to think about it, it gets there. Now, this is really important because the same thing happens when we, when we listen to music. You see, what kind of music we listen to begins to affect our brains and begins to make us develop new behaviors and patterns and conforms us to a certain behavior, which is why the type of music that you listen to is very, very important. Not only that, but your friends have the same thing. Their words, they say, how they behave. It is all the world conforming you and encouraging you to behave in such a way. Which is why if my daughter starts hanging around with girls who I don't think they remember the difference between underwear and shorts, I begin to say to her, hey, do you really want to hang out with those girls? Why, Daddy? Because they're going to conform to a certain different way, and I don't want you to conform to a behavior that I don't think is becoming of a godly woman. You see, they're going to, they're going to encourage you whether or not you know it. And they're not going to they may not even pressure you or invite you to, but you're just going to slowly conform because what you hang around with and what you read and what you listen to, what you, you watch, it all conforms you. It's the same thing with violent video games. You know how they do studies and tests on all this stuff, and they say the kids that are watching all these violent video games, they become desensitized to death and to guns and violence, and so we're raising an entire generation that feels more and more like it's okay to shoot someone. Why? Because you get another life in the next level, right? See, the world is conforming us constantly to something else. And Jesus says, I don't want you to conform. I want you to transform. Because what gets reminded gets remembered. Let me help you understand this because it's really an important question when we talk about why we do church because if we don't do church, we begin to quickly forget about God. We begin to quickly forget about God. Let me say that again. We begin to quickly forget about God. How many of you have ever not rode a bicycle for a long time and then you went to go get back on and you like you had to stop and go, how do you do this again? Two of you. Good. Excellent. So let me explain this to you. There's a, a lady named Dr. Caroline Leaf and she's the author of uh, Switch Your Brain On. A fascinating book. I heard her speak about a year ago, and it was one of those topics and one of those speakers, and when she was done speaking, it was clear that she was the smartest person in the room, and she was speaking to about 20,000 of us, all right? I heard her speak, and I was like, that's amazing. That's great. And basically, she is a neuro doctor, one of those doctors that studies brains and studies patterns. I think we go to the next slide, guys. And she sits there, and she tells you about how your brain works and how the neurologic signals in your brain connect. Just fascinating stuff. When she spoke, the first half hour of her speaking, I didn't understand a thing she said. She was that brilliant. All right. And finally, the last 10 minutes, she said, now let me make this simple for those of you that don't understand brain science is what she said. So let me help you out. And so today I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I've got a picture of the book on the board here uh, so that you could maybe say, hey, I really want to know more about that and get the book. It's a great book. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the, the very shrunk down simplistic version of what she says, because if I don't know that many of you are brain specialists like I'm not. And so I'm just going to shrink it down to the way she explained it that I understood it, okay? And if you want more of the science and the in-depth stuff behind it, check out the book. Uh, she says it like this. Your brain, actually, this is really cool. Science is proving what Scripture has been saying all along. But she says your brain, all right, is filled with all kinds of electrical signals and electrical pathways. And go to the next slide. And she says it actually works like this. Uh, the picture here on the right side is actually a single thought. A single thought. And so your brain works like this. When you have a new thought, it's like planting a tree, she said. It's like planting a seedling, okay? And then every time you think of it, it's like going back and watering the tree. And so every time you think of that thought, you come back and you, you put water and you care for the tree again. And then, and then you go away from it. Your electrical signals travel to somewhere new because you're thinking about something else. And you think about that again and it comes back and it waters the tree. And that tree begins to grow and grow and grow. And the more you think about it, the more it grows. Are you with me so far? And she said, the reason she likes to use it as a tree is she goes, imagine all these little, they look like little uh, strings coming out. She goes, imagine those as branches of a tree, and your tree's getting bigger and bigger, and, and it begins to have leaves, and it begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger every time you think about it. And she goes, that's literally what it looks like in your head. And so she says, every time you think about it, your tree gets bigger, and it, it grows more branches and more leaves, and becomes this huge thing in the real estate of your mind. 
she says, which only means that we got to be careful with what we're thinking about. And do not be conformed to the patterns, the behaviors of the world, but transform your mind to what God would like you to think about. Which is why addictions and like pornography and again, songs and junk that we put on our head, we, we keep going to this garden over here and we, we water and plant the bad stuff and it grows and it grows and it grows and it takes up all the space in our mind and the next thing you know, our brain is full of trees that we didn't want it to be full of. It's full of poison. It's full of bad things that we really don't want to run and play in that garden. Now, what's really interesting, she says that just like a tree and watering and planting the tree is that when you stop thinking about it, that begins to die. Which is why if you've ever went to ride a bicycle after not riding in a while, your brain kind of goes, all right, how do we do this again? And what it's doing is it's sending out electrical signals trying to find that spot in your brain where that tree was planted that taught you how to ride a bicycle. And so it's searching, it's searching, it's searching. It says right here, oh, it's kind of dead. And it begins to try to water it and say, hey, come back to life. Remind us how to do this. Come on, we got to get these dead branches back on here. And, and you can revive some of that. And so then your brain begins to go, oh yeah, you kind of grab and you kind of, you got to pedal the balance. For, okay, I got it. All right, here we go. Because you're reviving that dead tree you have. And and, 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 and that's how your brain works. Did you know all that? And so one of the places that do not be conformed to the patterns of this world but transform your mind would lead us to is to say, what are you planting in your head? Or as I like to say, what gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. So when you think about what gardens you have in your mind, metaphorically speaking, of course, but when you think about what kind of gardens or orchards or tree groves or vineyards, again, whatever you want to use the phrase, this electrical pass that create these enzymes in your head. When you think about that, when you go over to this garden, are the trees planted the trees that should be planted or not? You see, when we begin to miss church, we begin to forget about God. We begin to forget about how God wants us to behave. And so these trees over here, these godly trees that we have, this whole field that we said, hey, these are godly trees. They teach us how to behave, begin to die off because we begin to hang out over here and we begin to be conformed by the patterns of this world and we begin to water the wrong kind of trees. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating that science is coming to the point where it's actually saying, no, the scripture is true, and that we begin to conform or transform by what part of our trees and what part of our brain we actually pay attention to and water. In fact, she goes so far as to say that there are health consequences and worrying and places that we go to that we should never go to because we water the wrong trees, and it has physiological effects on our body. Again, Go read the book. It's a fascinating book. For us today, though, we want to stop right there and just know that we have a garden in our head that if we water the right tree, it'll grow and it'll continue to grow and it can become a major part of the real estate in our mind, which then affects the behavior that we have, which looks like this, which looks like this. I do marriage well. Why? Because I won't give up no matter how hard it is. Why? Why won't I give up? Because I have a God who never gave up on me. Because every time I think about giving up, I have to come face to face with my huge orchard of godly trees that I have here. And every time I think about giving up, I look at this tree and go, hey, hey, this tree reminds me that God never gave up on me. When I have that friend who has wronged me and says, uh, you know, I hate you because you did blah, 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 and it's, it's all completely off basis and it's all a lie. Every time I think, I'm going to be mad at them for the rest of my life and I'm going to show them I'm never going to talk to them. In fact, I may post something on Twitter to get back on them because that's what mature people do, right? And then I'm going to go to that tree and I look at that tree suddenly as I'm on my way out, my actions, but I got to go through this forest of godly trees before I can act and behave a certain way. And when I get there, as I'm walking through this forest of godly trees, it says, hey, Jesus forgave you while you were yet still his, scripture says, enemy. Are you really going to hold a grudge against somebody? Because that's not how Jesus behaved. Do you really want to behave that way? You see, and as my actions, my thoughts begin to move out of my mind and into practicality and into action of my fingers and hands and feet and my mouth, I got to go through this godly vineyard. I got to go through this whole set of trees. And I, I walk through this forest and it begins to transform what comes out of me because I planted this godly, godly, godly forest that says we, 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 we behave different. We're not conformed to the patterns, the behaviors of this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of the mind. It changes what I wear, young ladies, because I don't want people to look at me and think I'm a hooker. 
I want people to look at me and think, that's a godly woman, I better respect her. It changes how I date when I go out with a young lady because I want that young lady to leave and go, that was a godly man. He respected me and honored me and treated me like a gentleman the whole way. It changes how I behave and interact with my kids if I'm a parent and how I interact and behave with my grandkids if I'm a grandparent because I begin to look and go, you know what, I can give them clothing, I can give them shelter, I can give them food, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is that I gotta help them plant godly seeds in their head. And if I haven't planted a godly forest in their mind, I have failed as a parent and grandparent. And so I reevaluate my priorities as a parent and grandparent. It changes how I handle my money. Because I look at my money and I go, it's not mine, it's God's. Because that's what the godly trees remind me of. As I come to church and the godly thoughts, the transformation of my mind hits me every day. It reminds me that nothing's really mine. It's all God's. Some of you know that uh, we're in the midst of purchasing a farm and we're very excited about that and I can't wait to have you out and many of you have already been out and rode the horses and stuff. Uh, I had this opportunity Friday, a young lady was just by herself and I could tell she was a young lady as she walked up and I'm thinking she's maybe 13, I found out she's like 15 or 16. She goes to Fairborn, she'll be a a sophomore this year and uh, she came up to the farm and so I walked my horse out because we were out working with the horses and I walked my horse out to the driveway to meet her as she come up and she was really quiet and really shy and you know how a young lady can be especially when they meet someone big and scary and intimidating like me who's always loud because I'm slightly deaf and so she was walking up the driveway and I walked up and she started to talk to me now what she was saying was this she wanted to know if she could come and clean out stalls so that she could pet my horse that's what she said to me but I couldn't hear her at first because she was really really quiet right and so of course I, I don't think that's the right way to introduce yourself I think the right way to introduce yourself is say your name so I walk up as she's speaking and I go hi I'm Aaron and of course because I'm really loud and scary and she kind of backs away a second and then she comes up again and she asks me again if she could clean out our stalls so that she could pet our horses and I go hold on let's try this I'm Aaron and you are and she told me her name and we got to know each other a little bit and I said now tell me what you want and, and finally she's talking loud enough that I can hear her she wants to know again if she can clean out the stall so that she can pet our horses and of course I, my answer is no I said, no, that's not how this works. I said, we don't think this farm's ours, the horses are ours. We think this all belongs to God, and you can't come clean out our stalls to pet our horses. You can come hang out here, though, and I'll teach you how to ride. And she looked at me kind of weird, like a little, like you just saw something in the back of her eyes, and I said, don't worry, it's free. She got this huge smile on her face. And I thought, what a teachable moment. Hold on, I get to slip in the gospel right here. I got force it down there. I just get to slip it in right here. And I go, well, see, we, this is the reason we ha- why we have this place, because God kind of gave it to us, and we just think that's the way it should work. So you come over. We're going to teach you how to ride. And she was so excited, she, like, started to run away. And I said, no, wait, come back, come back. I got to get you in my information. We traded information. She's going to get with us here shortly. But, but, but I thought, that's just the transforming of the mind. See, the minute I went to go talk to her, I had to walk through this field of thoughts and, and godly fields and trees that I had planted. And, and, and before I got there, I said, hey, this is how we're going to interact. This is how we're going to behave with this young lady because this is how I understand and view the world around me because I have a godly field that I have to walk through every time I think and act. Okay. If I stop thinking of godly things and I stop focusing on my scripture and I stop coming to church, those trees, what happens to them? They, they die. And I begin to grow conforming trees to the patterns of the world. And I begin to think things are okay that I once probably didn't think things were okay. And I begin to behave in ways that I once thought I would never behave like that. And I was ashamed to see so-and-so behave like that. So why do we participate in church? Well, because what gets reminded gets remembered, right? What gets reminded gets remembered. So here's just two thoughts for you. When we don't participate in church, again, we talk about we forget God, right? We forget God because we stop hearing about God. We stop hearing about how, hey, marriage can be tough, but you got to keep going. You got to keep persevering. We stop hearing about how you got to forgive. We stop hearing about how you got to behave this way. We stop hearing about, hey, when life gets tough, it doesn't mean that God vanishes or that God doesn't care or that God's evil. When life gets tough, it just means that, hey, life's gotten tough and God's going to pull you through. And we stop surrounding ourselves with people who are cheering us on and holding us together. And like Sally said, she had a sermon a couple weeks ago and it kind of transformed a little bit of how she saw her situation. And she went from going, where are we at? God to go, right? 
And so we, we come on Sunday mornings and we gather in small groups and we gather together with friends who continue to push us to think godly thoughts. Why? Because we want to grow that godly field so that we walk through it so that we never forget about God because there's the one thing that scripture in life has taught us over and over and over and over again is what doesn't get thought about doesn't get thought about. And what doesn't get reminded doesn't get remembered. And we participate in church, number two, because we know that it will change and transform our hearts. We know that it will change and transform our hearts. So here's just a couple shot in the arm thoughts I have as we begin to set up the next week's uh, sermon in the entire series. It goes like this, all right? Uh, people don't come to church because uh, we haven't given them services that they don't want to miss. Because we don't talk about church as something we can't miss. Because we haven't thought through church as being something that I go to because I can't miss it because it helps grow these trees that I want which affect my behavior, which affect the behavior of my children, which affect the behavior of everyone around me. And so I can't miss church because it's exciting and we go and we water these trees and they grow up so big and I get to live in the shade of them and I get to go, God, this is awesome. Every day I walk through this beautiful forest and it's just an amazing thing. And then we, we forget that. You see, people don't come to church because we don't live as if we can't miss it. Because we don't know that we can't miss it. Because we've forgotten why we do church. Another thought is like this, is that sometimes church is like watching a bad love story. Yeah, have you ever thought about it like that? Church is like watching a bad soap opera love story. Right? Because sometimes the church doesn't behave the way it should. Like we fight over stupid stuff in the church. I'm not talking here so much because I haven't experienced that because we really try to keep focused on what should be important. But, but the church worldwide, we fight on stupid stuff, don't we? Colors of carpet, whether or not you should be allowed to do this over here, do this, or whether or not we're going to put the dishes away like this, whether or not we're going to paint the room like this. And the world's watching going, look, you guys don't really know how to love each other. Those aren't godly trees. We're not coming. We don't want to be like that. We want to be something different. And so here's my thought, kind of to wrap all this up, as we talk about planting godly trees. And again, what you're thinking about, what you're around, what you're behaving, who you surround yourself with. Is it godly trees and godly seeds that we're planting? Are we watering the right trees? Or are we killing them? And are we doing something else? And I want to tell you one of my favorite stories to tell. In fact, if you've been at a wedding that I've done in the past six years, you may already know this story. In fact, some of you who have been at several of them may feel like you want to come up and tell it for me. But it's just one of my favorite stories, so I'm going to tell it to you again. A story's about a couple named John and Lenore Jones. I met John and Lenore jo Jones when they were in their late 60s, and they were already on their second marriage because they had both lost a loved one already. And they got together, and they started dating, and you know how it just that all works out. And finally, in their 60s, early 60s, they got married. And so that's when I met them. And I met them as a junior high boy who was riding my bike down the sidewalk as fast as I can by their house racing. But here's how I would encounter them. Every time I would go by their house, they had one of those front porches with this swing that they would sit on. And I think they were just there. I, they woke up, went, and sat on the swing all day. That's what they did. But every time I would ride by, they were making out. And, and especially as a junior high kid, people in their 60s should never have made out. And I would ride by thinking to myself, I hope John's teeth stay in his mouth. Because they weren't just kissing, they were making out, you know. And that's just gross, right? A junior high kid, you're like, ah! And so I would ride by really fast because I didn't want to have to see it. And I think they were doing this. I think they were like looking down the street going, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes, ready? Let's kiss. And that's how it went. Because every time I went by, that's what they were doing. All right? They were probably dehydrated the rest of the day. I don't know. All right? And so every time I went by, they would do that, and it was kind of grossing me out. But here's what happened. Somewhere in my eighth grade year, John found out that I love fried fish, and John made it a point to begin to pour into my life. Now, I just say this because I want to time out. Some of you that are grandparents, you need to begin to invest in teenagers' lives just like John and Lenore did in my life because you're going to hear the story of transformation in my life, and you have a time and a different ability than the parents do, and you don't have to be a relative to that kid. There are kids all over the service and upstairs right now who would love to have you pour into the life just like John and Lenore did for me. And watch how this worked. They, John invited me over for fried fish because I love fried fish. And it was weird the first two or three times. And after that, it began to feel like family. And I would sit and John taught me how to love my wife. 
Now, my parents did a pretty good job of that, but it's something different. Here's another couple. And I would sit down at the meal like this, and I would be at, they had like a small card table kind of for, for dinner, and so it was kind of crowded. And John always fixed the food because he just, he'd fish all the time and just loved to have someone else to eat fish with because Lenore didn't really like fish, all right? But she would eat it because John, so we were at the table, and John would, would be sitting there, and we'd be talking, we'd be talking, we'd be talking, and, and, and then he would say, now, dear, I made pie. John always made homemade pie for dinner. Oh, it was great. It's kind of the runny you know, it kind of oozes out. You kind of scoop it up really quick or else you miss the entire filling of the pie. And so we'd be sitting there and John would say things like, now Lenore, I made, I made pie and I put extra sugar in it, but it's still not as sweet as you. And I would squirm like, don't start kissing, please, right? And then John would get up and he would always get Lenore two pieces of pie and this was kind of his standard line. He would bring it back to her and he'd put it down in front of her and say, now dear, I got you two pieces of pie because you're, you're just disappearing on me. You're so skinny. And I would look and think, man, are you blind? She ain't disappearing on anybody. And I watched this couple care. Now, I didn't know this. But they were just walking through my mind, planting seeds. Showing me a different way to do it. Another way to do it. A godly way. And they would have some of the strangest conversations. And they would ask me stuff. And again, you don't know this, but your junior high and young kids, just, they just love to talk to people. Especially the ones that are interested authentically in their lives. And they would walk through my mind and they would plant seeds and they would water seeds and they would invite me to visit trees in my mind that I, I didn't even know were there or that I hadn't even wanted to visit. They would ask me questions about girlfriends and they would ask me questions about school and they would ask me questions about my future. And again, they would take me to places in my mind I, I didn't really always want to go to, but they would invite me there. And because they were friends and we were going to eat soon, I would go there and Again, looking back, I didn't know what they were doing, and I don't know if they knew what they were doing in the scientific way, but they were definitely doing God's work. When John and Lenore were in their 70s and I began college, Lenore was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I watched John, who I was especially, I'm really starting to become envious of because in his 70s, he still had a full head of brown hair. All right, and I, I, it's amazing to me because I'm like in my 30s and it's going, all right? It's good, disappearing on me, right? My wife says I don't have to cut the top anymore. She just cuts the sides, right? And so I watched this guy who had a full head of brown hair in his 70s, and one year it went completely white caring for his wife. And I would show up at their house on my visits back from college or in the summer, and I would step in and knock on the door, and John would come and kind of peek out and go, oh, Aaron, it's good. She's going to love to see you. Hold on. And John was covered in something, and he kind of stunk. And later I would find out that John was carrying Lenore to the bathroom. And sometimes they didn't make it. And so we had to clean both of them up before I could come in and visit. And they got a hospice bed right there on the first floor. And they got a, a chair that John slept in literally for a year. Every night John slept in a chair beside her bed. And they, they may not have known this, but they were showing me what it means to live out your marriage vows. For better, for worse, till death do us part. And I watched this couple, and when Allie and I got married, I began to tell her about John and Lenore Jones because they had already passed away. And I, I said, this is who I want to be like. I want to be like that couple. And there's more to the story, but we'll stop there just with this idea. Just, they were my heroes. They were my mentors. And so when I go into my mind and I say, what is it like to be married? What is it like to say, we're going to do this right? I, I return to the tree that John and Lenore planted in that memory. And I keep coming to that. And I keep watering it. And I keep saying, one day my wife and I are going to be the people on the porch. And when some junior high kids, I'm going to go, quickly, dear, make out with me. <laughs> and she'll probably smack me. But I want to be that kid. And then I want to I be that couple. And that's our goal. Because we want to have the ability to walk through some kid's mind and say, let us plant some trees for you. Some godly trees. And I say that as a challenge to us individually saying, again, what trees are you planting? What seeds are you planting? What trees are you watering? What, what, where are you doing that for yourself and for others? But I also use that story as a challenge to us because, again, sometimes the church looks like a, ba like a bad love story. 
And when we begin to ask the question, why church? Well, the church should exist, why? Because we wanna help people move closer to Jesus, and the way they're gonna do that is if we start looking like someone madly in love with each other and someone madly in love with God. And when people ride by our church, again, we shouldn't start making out with each other because that would just be weird. But we should behave in such a way that people drive by and they kind of turn their heads and go, what's, what's the weird group of people? They should see us behave and spend our money and time doing snack pack and clothing store and apartment ministry. They should just see us doing things and we say, we love each other and we love the world and we love Jesus. And because of all those things together, this is how we're going to behave. Come watch us make out with God. Wouldn't that be fun? And when people begin to go, why church? They should go, I don't know, but they got something we don't have yet. And when I grow up, that's what I want to look like. That's a picture of a church that I want to be at. And so here's my challenge for you. As we begin this new series, number one, I want to invite you to invite someone else to come to church. Why? Because now you know why you come here. Because what gets reminded gets remembered. And you come here because you want to plant and water the right kind of trees. You want to grow a godly forest in your mind that as you walk through, it transforms your behavior on the way out. Because the other option is to be conformed by the world. So my challenge to you is, how are you planting and watering the right trees? And do we read the Bible because, man, I feel guilty about it? Or, you know what, I'm working hard to fall madly in love with Jesus, and I understand he wrote me these love letters. And I'm going to try to crawl into some of them. And by the way, just to make that easy, I downloaded the Bible app from Life Church TV, and I listen to it every morning as my devotional. It's really easy. Some guys tell me the Bible in my head. It's great. And who I hang out with. Again, watering, planting the right trees. And I just challenge you, as a church and as individuals, are we being transformed by the renewing of our mind, or are we being conformed? Why, church? Because what gets reminded gets remembered. Will you pray with me? God, if my mind is a forest of trees, I need to confess that there's some weeding that needs to be done. I have allowed some, some shrubbery to grow up in my mind that should never be there. There are some trees that are infected. There are some invaders that are attacking. So I ask that you come as the holy gardener and begin to clear and clean out my mind. Transform me that I may be like you, not conformed to the patterns and behaviors of this world. God, I pray this prayer not just for myself, but for all those who are gathered here this morning. And as we begin to know why church and do why church and talk about why church, I pray that you help us become the church that says, you know what? I can't live without it, and my neighbors need Jesus too. May we truly be people whose entire lives are about moving people closer to you. The holy, loving God, we pray and give thanks to. Amen. Go forth. Plant new forests, godly forests. Invite others to plant forests. Pour out into the lives of others. Plant seeds into their heads. Remember the truth of the forest that God called you to run through, that you are beautiful and sacred because he made you that. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are blessed. Amen.